Okay. Do you always hike alone? Not always. I have a, uh, a good friend, one of my original backpack buddies, uh, Ted Packard. He was one of the, uh, the, the two originals, Ted Packard and Charlie Peterson. That we were the three that did the whole thing of the primitive area before it became the wilderness area in, the, in 1984. Uh, and then there was a 40 year period while well, I was gone in Central America, Guatemala, and no backpacking. And, uh, Ted and me went on a trip or two and then we got in contact with Charlie who lived up in Washington. And in 2008, I believe it was, we did what we called our, our golden anniversary backpack. Us three original backpacking buddies made a trip into Red Castle, the Red Castle area, together. So uh, th there's at least one trip a year where Ted goes with. And then I've had oftentimes uh, uh, in the in summers a family backpack. I've invited some from the family and the whole to get together. We've done that a few times. Uh, but usually it's alone. And in a way, uh, it's the way I prefer it because I'll, I'll, I'll confess, I, I, I don't move as fast as I used to. I, in fact, I, I call my, my hiking speed, I stock up the trail. You know, I kind of, oh, oh, there's, there's a big animal around the, I'm stalking it. And, and by going slowly and carefully, which I, of course, have to do, whether I like it or not, it's been a great blessing because all of a sudden I see things and get photographs of things, which I'll swear, there's a lot of people who told me that doesn't exist in UN. Well, it's because these are guys that they brag about doing 20 and 30 miles a day. They don't see anything. I see everything, or a lot of, a lot of things at least, and it, it makes it all so much more enjoyable, and then I try and share with everybody by making YouTube videos or what I call photo essays and put all this stuff on, you know. So, have, have any of you heard of Brett Prettyman? Oh, yes. He's an outdoor writer from the Salt Lake Tribune. He did a big article on me here a few years ago with a whole, a big spread. Let's see, it wasn't a red castle, it was of, uh, uh, Reconnaissance Lake and Triangle Mountain, which to me rivals Red Castle as the most beautiful mountain scene in, in Utah. But it, he had it on, on his, I guess it's a Sunday edition, and, and, and the whole, the whole outlook, it was just one big picture, cover picture uh, that he did for me and did this article. Nobody else? Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I don't know, I, it's, it's uh, but like I say, uh, s some of my kids, uh, I've got two, uh, two uh, kids that are ex-Marines, and you know, we go up the trail, and they get so bored, me, you know, with, with my pace, and me stopping often to take pictures of things, they just disappear up the trail, they're gone, <laughs> and I'm not sure whether I'm ever going to see them again. It's boring for them, but it's the way I have to do it, and I have learned to like doing it that way. No. And these films are worth seeing because you'll see a lot more than you'll ever get to see. You know, if you don't like them, yet. they're beautiful. Get on no, I, I love uh, my stocking face. <laughs> <Yeah>. Five miles <laughs> a day, oh, that's just wonderful. And this summer, I don't know, we'll see. I, I, I say on my website, uh, uh, when I talk about all these trips, I, I said, well, you know, I, what I've been doing, going around every day uh, with this weight on my back, it, okay, it's kept my back strong. In fact, I've tried to jog without weight, of course, and it feels really strange because I don't have this weight on my back. Uh, and uh, so I have this uneasy feeling in my back, and so I can't even jog anymore. But anyway, I, uh, I say that, well, this I think will have me strong, my back will be strong. Uh, once I get going on the trail, I, uh, it'll be slow the first trip, probably, the first few days, and then hopefully I will be able to pick up the pace and lengthen my stride and stretch out the distances. <laughs> uh, you've all probably heard that statement, of, of pick up your pace and lengthen your stride. I think it was uh, Spencer W. Kimball that coined a phrase, something like that. And I've used it, but I've added on and, and stretch out the distances, you know. Hopefully, I'll be able to do that. I don't know for sure. We'll see. We've got to try it. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Uh, you know, if you know, if you if you don't uh, if you don't have a dream and don't attempt to uh, accomplish it, I mean, hey, what's what's life worth living for anyway? You know.
Hey, thanks for coming. Thank you very much. Most informative. Anything else? What maps do you like to use? What maps? Well, I have one of them. This is an old one. Uh, National Geographic, High Uinta Wilderness. This is uh, the, the basic map of, of the High Uinta. I actually started this whole project was supposed to be just the wilderness area. I didn't want to stretch out, but you know, all of a sudden, up in, up in like I think I mentioned, up in uh, Wyoming, a woman came up to me afterwards, you've got to go further east. And then I come to and visit Navi, and she says, you've got to come further west. <laughs> and so she gave me this wonderful publication. Maybe it's available for them, I don't know. It's about lumbering in on the Weaver River, or in this area. And it talks about kayakers on the Weaver River and on the Provo River. And so there's a, this, but you see, this is out of the wilderness area. Now I have been to Notch Pass, which actually you look down on the headwaters of the, of the Weaver River. And that's out of the primitive area. That's one trip that I have made that is out of the primitive area. And eventually I've got to uh, go up the Weaver here and, and, and because there's, there was a lot of kayaking that was done here. It was, much of it was done after the uh, Transcontinental Railroad was finished and they started running fur hill to Park City and, and all over and so there was still, there was need of, uh, of uh, railroad ties. And so, uh, I don't, to me it doesn't look like the Weaver River is big enough to, uh, to have a, a drive of railroad, but it, when, when the runoff, you know, uh, that's, and, and, and I, th I think in the publication, you gave me, it does describe, it was there or somewhere else I read about the Weaver, uh, that there were years when there wasn't enough runoff to have a, a river drive of, of railroad ties. Uh, so that happens. Uh, so, so I, yeah, I've got to eventually uh, explore the, the Weaver and do a little bit more on the Provo. And, uh, so I am, have spread out and we'll have to keep I have it, I'm into Wyoming, and, and so I've got to come to the Weaver too. Okay. The flumes that you talked about, they were all wood construction. Yes. Uh huh. They were made out of planks, about two inches thick, uh, uh, about uh, about uh, 36 inches by 36. There were several planks in them, uh, and there was a uh, uh, braces that held them all together. And uh, up along the uh, from the Bear River Ranger Station on the Mirror Lake Road, uh, a couple of miles up, the, the road that, that's called the Whitney Road. And that actually comes over and eventually, I guess it comes out right here. Yeah. At least you can go up here and connect on to that. Yes. Uh, Chalk Creek and all of that. Uh, but uh, it, it just a little bit up that Whit Whitney Road, what, maybe 200 yards or less from the highway, there is a display there about the Hilliard Flume. So there are pictures of it. Of course, I have pictures of, uh, of all this stuff on my, on my website. I actually have 14 either photo essays or YouTube videos about the kayakers, the Hilliard Flume, the Halfeeder Flume, Bear Town. Uh, I kind of cover all of this. And so you'll see pictures, artists' depictions of what the Hilliard Flume would look like. And it, it was uh, considered uh, at first it was called uh, uh, Sloan's Folly, I believe. Sloan was the guy that had to do with it. But it actually worked pretty good and was considered by a lot of people uh, quite an engineering feat for a number of years. Uh, it just didn't last long. Uh, it was from about 1873 until about 1880, so seven, ten years or so, and then it was abandoned. Uh, and uh, the, the uh, plume was, what they, the way it was described, it was cannibalized. And, ranchers and people, you know, just took all of it. In fact, you see buildings, uh, uh, barns and cabins and whatnot along the Mirror Lake Road that are built out of materials from the flume. How many days are you normally out when you're out on a trip that you plan? Uh, the trips that I have planned, these 14 trips, uh, usually they're uh, four, five, six days. I have one or two trips, at, uh, at least one, uh, on the Uinta River that uh, could probably take me as much as nine days. And that's going to be tough because it's going to require quite a load uh, to carry. I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to get my weight down on the food. Uh, I've got some better equipment now. Uh, I don't use a sleeping bag, for example. I use uh, what's called a quilt. 
it's from the Golight Company. It only weighs 15 ounces, but it can warm down to 20 degrees. And, and so I just, even before I had this quilt, I used my sleeping bag like that. I, I, I wouldn't zip it closed unless it was really cold. I'd just stick my feet in the end of it and lay it over the top of me, with, with, uh, unzipped. And so I was, it was basically like a quilt. And then I finally bought, got the quilt, which is a lot lighter, uh, and it only weighs 15 ounces. And, and then I've got a, a new tent too that only weighs a, a pound 10 ounces. So I, I'm working on the weight, but these long trips, you, you have to take certain basic foods, and I, but I, I, I'm, uh, I'm going to take along a number of different types of spices and whatnot so I can eat more fish and, and, and change the flavor a little bit, you know, to, to keep it from getting boring or, you know. Make it more interesting. Uh, so I, uh, I, I've even I've, I've just bought recently three books on mushrooms. Um, I uh, on my trip up uh, east work of Blacksburg last year, which is the one up where I talk about uh, uh, Bigfoot. There I, I have all series of pictures of, of mushrooms. Uh, it just happened to be the time when they they were just everywhere, and it's just fascinating subject. And so I started doing some research and to be able to talk about them a little bit. Of course, mushrooms are, can be very dangerous, to say the least, and, and so I've, I'm gonna be doing some studying and seeing if uh, I can't pick out a few that for sure are safe. You, you want to make so sure to that try. all of your bases are covered before you try <laughs> eating any of them. Down in Guatemala, the, the Indians go out and, and gather mushrooms every year, and, they're, and every year there are a number of Indian families that all die from eating poisonous oh. mushrooms. <coughs> so, so you have to be careful. And you'll put all that in your survival. Oh yeah, uh, I, I'm going to have. Uh, uh, I've reissued a couple of my uh, uh, preparation uh, videos. One, the first one is about physical preparation. Second was about supplements, you know, like uh, in uh, performance enhancing medications, <laughs> like Lance Armstrong used. Now, <laughs> I'm not in the Olympics, or I'm not in a, uh, the, the big race, and so you know, if I, I, uh, I'm not saying that I'm using those things that got Lance Armstrong in trouble, but. If I could get them cheap enough, maybe <laughs> anything that's going to help me. No, but I but I am using I do use a lot of supplements. So I have my second uh, video is about supplements and things that have really helped make and help me help keep me going. Mm -hmm. And then the third one is about gear and uh, and food, the equipment and food. Uh, and I've done I did that a few years ago. Uh, I'm going to redo it before the backpacking season to show some of the new equipment that I have and talk a little bit about some of the ways I'm going to try and uh, uh, reduce the, the weight of the food that I have to take. You can't do it just with fish though. I, I did go on a five day trip once just with my fishing equipment and salt shaker. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. And <laughs> after five days, just living on fish, and there was a day or so when I was about timberline, and there was no wood. There was no way to cook the fish that I was catching. I had to eat them raw. And I found that I really wasn't as hungry as I thought I was. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so I, all of a sudden, I got to a point where, unless I was in my sleeping bag, or around a nice fire, I was just shaking with cold all the time. I just didn't have, any kind of nutrition that would warm my body. And so I finally said, okay, I've learned something. It's time for me to get out of here. In fact, that was up uh, in the Red Castle area. And so I decided uh, all of a sudden one afternoon, you know, this is it, I've, I've learned my lesson. I gotta get out of here. And so I headed down the trail. Now this was a number of years ago when I was in pretty good shape. I would run for 45 minutes, then I would lay down for 15. And then I would run for 45 because I had to get to the car before it got dark. Back in those days, we didn't have headlamps, you know, all this nice stuff that, you know, we use today. Uh, and I finally got to the car, and I headed for Mountain View, Wyoming. I turned the heater on in the car, full blast. And since I wasn't exercising anymore, uh, my body was just, I was just cold as can be. 
even with the heater, full blast. And I was so hungry, I, I, had a, I, I used to have a tackle box with all kinds of medications and stuff for any emergency. And I went through that to see if I couldn't find something in my medicine box to eat. And I found a box of Pepto-Bismol tablets. Oh, no. I started just <laughs> chewing on the Pepto-Bismol tablets. I had to eat something. Wow. <laughs> I finally got to, you know, a convenience store in, in Mountain View. And I oh, went in and bought some yogurt and some donuts. And I can't remember all kinds of stuff. Of course, then I really upset my stomach. <laughs> but I learned that just fish at, by the... By but it's got to be a big part of what I'm going to eat on these trips, so otherwise I'm not going to be able to do it. Okay? Anything else? Yeah. Okay. What kind of a water filler do you use? That well, you know, I, I've tried several. You know, the pump, and oh, I get so tired of pumping, you know. And, and then here a couple of years ago, I, I, I heard about this, the Sawyer's squeeze system. You squeeze it. Oh, hey, that, that. I tried that a couple of years. And it was just as hard as pump. And so I uh, just got a new system, which is platypus, but it's, uh, uh, you, you have a, the dirty water bag, and then it goes through a filter into the clean bag, or your, your canteen, your bottle, whatever, your pot, and, and it's gravity system. Within, uh, it, it only takes about two minutes or so, for, for two liters to drain down into your clean uh, container. And I haven't tried it yet, but that's what I'm going to use. It just sounds like any, anything better than this pumping or the squeezing. Yeah, I had five of us up in Rocky Mountain. Yeah. Well, you know, on my 27 day expedition, I did, uh, I'd just come back to Guatemala. I didn't know anything about all kinds of new stuff that had developed. I didn't, you know, back then, the good old days, we didn't know about GRD, uh, you know, all these waterborne diseases. And we just, you know, try and drink the water as, as, from as good a source as we could find. And, and so I went on that trip, and I didn't have any kind of a purification system. I had some uh, tablets, and then, of course, I knew about boiling. And so I, I tried the tablets. I didn't like the taste because, of course, uh, they say now the tablets don't add any taste to the water. But, uh, I, but I didn't like the chlorine taste. So then I tried boiling, but I, but I didn't like the smoky taste. And so from then on, for that whole 27 days, I just always looked for the best water source available and filled up all my containers when I had a good source. And I and that's all I did the whole trip, and I never ever got sick. Maybe I'll just like. So what have you done to avoid a bear? Oh, you know I I've, I've never seen a bear up in the U.S. I've never seen any tracks of bear up in the U.S. I had been to Canyons National Park. We went on a backpack with my friend uh, uh, Ted Packer, and they, uh, one of his boys. We went up to down. We saw bear tracks down there, but I haven't in the U.S. And so I'm just not ever worried about it. There was one trip I was coming from Reconnaissance Lake, and I met two fellows that were backpacking. They said it was their first backpack trip. And they said, well, what about animals in the winter? And I said, well, there are deer and there's moose. And, no, 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 we want to know about bears. And I said, well, I've never seen one, so I don't worry about it. Down along the rivers and the creeks, as you come up into the high country, or you do have to coming up, but once you get over 10,500 feet, you probably don't have to worry about it. I met a, a fellow that worked for the Forest Service over on uh, Swift Creek once, it, but his job was to try and find wolverines. There had been 90 uh, supposed sightings of wolverines in the Uintas, but nobody had ever come up with proof, uh, a picture and whatnot. And so his job was to, to do that. And so he had up above uh, around 10,500 feet, he had a number of bait stations. He would pick up a dead deer or animals along the highway and he'd go up on horseback and he'd hang them, uh, he'd stretch a rope or cable and, and then he had his uh, electronic uh, cameras, you know, uh, uh, movement uh, uh, operated cameras. And once a week he'd go back up and he'd get the memory cards and, and change the batteries and put new memory cards in and take them home, put them on his computer to see what he got. 
And he had a couple of shots where it, it was really blurry and it looks like it maybe it was about the size of a wolverine, but nothing for sure. But I started asking him about other animals. I said, what about bear? Never, never did he ever get a uh, bear up at, uh, at those elevations. He said, but uh, uh, he had a base station down on the Yellow, Yellowstone Creek or Yellowstone River at about 8,500 feet and there he got pictures of bears. He never got a wolverine. So, so according to him, uh, 10,500 feet above, you don't have to worry about bears. That's what, that's what I told these two backpackers. Well, uh, I went down the trail. I got to Jack and Jill Lake, and there there were a bunch of uh, backpack or horse packers from the Uta Basin. And I met them and talked to them, and I said, oh, now, now look, if you guys have any exciting stories to tell, let me know, you know, I, I can put them into my book or whatever. Oh, you want to know an exciting story? Hey, Josh, come over. So Josh Christensen came over, and I have this on my website too. Uh, but he uh, he started telling about how he had worked for the Forest Service, uh, running a pack stream of a uh, string of, of horses, taking the equipment and stuff up to uh, some crews that were working on trails and whatnot uh, on Lake Fork, and they had some volunteer kids from the east. And there was one of them apparently that was writing, he would take letters down and then read letters back and packages that the families would send to these kids. And this one kid apparently was moaning and groaning about the, the, the food was awful and it rained every day and, uh, and the mosquitoes were eating them alive. And you know, he had nothing good to say about you. And, and all of those are problems you have to learn to cope with, you know. <laughs> So anyway, he, uh, but Josh, as he was uh, approaching the camp, which was about 9,500 feet, this is about where the trail takes off from uh, to Lambert Meadows. But he, uh, he said he saw bear tracks, fresh bear tracks. So he, when he got into camp, and he told everybody, okay, hey, there's a bear in the area, and so we've got to keep, have a clean camp. And so that night, they, they got a big bonfire going, and, but about one, but this one kid got a package from his uh, family. Didn't let anybody know what he had got. It was, uh, among other things, a package of Oreo cookies. And he didn't want to share with anybody, so he, he stuck it down in the bottom of his sleeping bag. <laughs> well, at about one o'clock in the morning, Josh heard this kid scream and got up and saw a bear dragging him and his sleeping bag out of his tent. <laughs> And Josh wasn't supposed to have a gun as a Forest Service employee, but he had his 30-30 uh, lever action rifle, and he fired a warning shot. And the bear dropped the kid, sleeping back in the kid, and came for him. And he tried to chamber it around, but it jammed, and the bear hit him. The rifle fell onto the ground, and the bear had him in a bear hug, literally, and he lifted up his shirt and showed the, the, the scars, you know, on both sides. And, and he said, uh, and I thought, oh, I'm a gun. And then he had flashed into his mind something he had seen on the Discovery Channel. Someone who had got into the jaws of a shark and then hauled off and, and hit the shark in the nose. And the shark had dropped him. So he said, I just reared back like this, and I gave him my best Rocky Balboa punch, <laughs> and the bear dropped him, and he was able to scuttle back, find his rifle, somehow get it around in there, and he shot the bear and killed him. But he had these scars to show, and, uh, and so all of a sudden, I decided maybe I better start being more careful. <laughs> so I... Uh, I do hang, you know, put my, most of my food in a bag and I hang it in the tree and I like to take a little stuff in my tent on the eve at night. <laughs> and so I, you know, I, I uh, but I've, I've tried, uh, I thought, let's see, maybe I better have pepper spray. And then I think, but in a tent, the pepper spray is not going to do me any good at all. Uh, I camped out at Dead Horse Lake once. Uh, I left a pot out uh, soaking. Uh, you know, I'd cooked up some spaghetti or something and, and, and so to let it soak to, to soften everything up so I could clean it. I hit outside and during the night I heard the top of it being knocked off. Then I heard a lap, 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 lap. Something was out there drinking out of my pot and I don't know what it was. 
I didn't want to have to shoot a hole in my tent. <laughs> but, but, you know, I thought the pepper spray, uh, if, if a bear came at me in my, when I was in my tent, it would hurt, the bear pepper spray would hurt me more than the bear. And so, what I'd be like carrying my Colt 45 Defender. <laughs> and so, and I just try and be careful. And, and try and get up above uh, 10,500 feet as fast as I can. <laughs> <laughs> So I still haven't had problems, but you know, it could happen. Uh, ever since I met Josh, you know, it has you think. And then of course, there was a story uh, here a few years ago of the kid in American Fort Canyon uh, that got killed. I think he was the first one in Utah that ever got killed by a bear. And there are bear stories that you hear every now and again. Probably recently you've heard one down in, from down in Florida, bears coming right in the, in the community, in the, in the and draft this woman, or however that went, I can't remember. But, uh, so yeah, you gotta be careful. Now I did have to shoot a warning shot twice, and it wasn't for bears. One of them was on the east fork of Bear River. I, I was going up through there, and, uh, and I passed some cattle on the trail, and I got to sort of a, where it narrows down, and I laid down to rest, uh, you know, like every 30 minutes or so. I, I just rest for 15 minutes. That's what I usually have to do. Uh, and I was resting, and all the, and I was using my my uh, my camera bag. It's a waist <coughs> bag, you know, and uh, I had the gun stuck in there. Uh, but I was using that as a pillow. Yeah. Uh, all of a sudden, I heard some heavy breathing. And I opened my eyes, and it was a Charles bull. And he apparently was trying to move his cows up the canyon, and I was an obstacle. And he had snot dripping from his nose and fire coming from his eye. He was pawing the ground. And, and I grabbed my camera and my gun, and I took a shot and clicked the camera, hoping that it, there would be some kind of adjustment there. And I do have a picture of the Charlotte bull kind of wheeling around. And so that was the first time I had to fire a, running, uh, a warning shot, and it worked. Uh, um, the other time was with a moose, yeah. with a cow moose. And there were some, and she had some young ones nearby. So she came, and came after me, and uh, had to fire a warning shot again. So I like my cool 45. <laughs> In Guatemala, I had to carry a gun all the years I lived down there. And so I just got used to carrying the gun. One other thing on your map, get an old map. They're ten times better than the new map. Uh -huh. Because I'll show you more. And the new well, one, the new you one. mean older than this even? Well, that's now this this that's is a very that's old. That's I, I have a couple a good, newer. That's a good map. Version. Don't get rid of it. Yeah, no, it's uh, yeah. there's some scotch tape here and there, you know, but. Yeah, they, these are relatively waterproof and, and they're, they're good maps. Now, now well, about maps, I should mention, I have the uh, National Geographic CD-ROM uh, where I can, uh, the topographical maps. Yeah. And so uh, these maps that I have on my website, for every trip that I have planned, there's a link at the bottom, you click on it and you go to the topographical maps where I have the route and the miles and uh, elevation profile, I, I have all that stuff that I get that off of these top topographical maps. Yeah. I also have this, but then I have these topographical maps too. So and sometimes I get uh, some shots from Google Earth of the areas I'm going into to help me, help orient me a little bit better. And... Well, uh, did we do it? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Well, thank you. I appreciate being here.